that preserves all her rights and goes forth in power and might that reflects our values and preserves our rights and goes forth in power and might. Good evening and welcome to Your Right to Know by the Fitchburg Republican City Committee. My name is Mary Lotz and I will be your host for this evening's show. And before we get started, the Fitchburg Republican City Committee would love to uh, wish all of our viewers and all of our friends a very happy, healthy, and prosperous 2015. It's hard to believe we've already come another whole year already, but welcome to Your Right to Know. And tonight, my guest is... Uh, one of our members, one of my friends, a welcome and familiar uh, panelist, although not always in uniform, <laughs> and that's Professor John Strang. Thank you, John, for being with us tonight in uniform. Thank you. Not to celebrate the new year, but to talk about what our show is going to be about. And that really is going to talk about this book, a booklet which you wrote, which is uh, a synonym of heroin, of Heroism. Me, a synonym for heroism, Fitchburgers, and this is Three Wars in Three Centuries. Right. Uh, John, I've read this book cover to cover. I'm a, a, a note taker, an underliner, and I have just written all through this book. So thank you very much for being on the show and talking to us tonight about your book about Fitchburg history through three wars, starting with the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and ending with World War II. To introduce our viewers to you, we of course know you as, as our friend and, and member of our group, but I'd just like to briefly go through a little bit of history of John. John studied at Hiram College in Ohio and the University of Friedberg in Germany for several years, and you were awarded your PhD in philosophy from Boston University in 1984. You've taught in numerous colleges and universities throughout New England. Um, however, in 1980, to bring us to your musical talents uh, and involvement, in 1980 you founded the Crane's Music, uh, the uniformed recreation of the wind band in George Washington's army, and you oftentimes had many opportunities to perform in public at things like the American Bicentennial, the National Service Historical Societies. Uh, you played at a four-day long concert in Yorktown Bicentennial in Virginia in 1981. You've been performing at the U.S. embassies in France during their 20th century, uh, 20th 200th anniversary. Um, your band was subsequently enlarged and continued giving concerts to Boston Harbor Fest, Boston First Night Celebrations, Castle Hill and Ipswich, and various other venues. In 2002, you moved to Fitchburg and I guess became an official Fitchburger at that time. And at that time, you also founded the Canelo Consort, which was composed of musicians from North Worcester County. You play the bassoon, uh, with various regional ensembles. Um, in addition to being a scholar and a musician, you've written several works of uh, books, two historical philosophical novels, a memoir of your military service in Germany, and most recently, again, and I will say it right this time, a synonym of heroism, Fitchburgers, Three Wars in Three Centuries. And we'll talk about where people can get this book afterwards, because like I said, it is an excellent book. So to start out tonight's show, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your uniform. Oh, sure. Uh, I guess the first thing that's evident, or seems to be evident to a viewer, is uh, it looks like it's a British uniform, because of course it's red. Mm -hmm. uh, but the actual uh, practice of the time was for, uh, in, in military uh, regiments, uh, musicians in those regiments oh. would reverse colors <coughs> of their uh, coats. And the reason for this was that musicians were technically non-combatants. There was also a secondary reason in the case of what was called the field music, that is the fifes and drums, because they had a military function of s signaling. They would signal essentially officers' commands in the heat of battle. You can hear a drum over even fire uh, of, of, of weapons, of muskets. 
Uh, but in any case, musicians being considered non-combatants, there had to be an easy way to, to recognize them. Okay. And uh, they reversed the colors of the coats. So if you belong to a regiment whose men had blue coats with red facings, the musicians in that regiment would have red coats with blue yeah. facings. Was that ever confusing to... No, no. Uh, because in, in the context, uh, it wasn't as if you thought you had British redcoats among you. Sure. Uh, uh, if your entire regiment were, were attired in red in the American Continental Army, then it would have been a difficulty. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was one, one regiment that was entirely attired in red in the Continental Army, a mm -hmm. Connecticut regiment. Uh, they captured some British uniforms and they... Oh. Use them. But that's, that explains the coloration. These are American uniforms, but they appear to be British. Uh -huh. Could you explain to us this name of Fitchburg, where Fitchburg got its name, and, and I think also the symbolism of why Fitchburg, the name, is unique from many other names in New England towns? Good question. Uh, John Fitch, uh, I, I assume that most of us have heard the name John mm -hmm. Fitch. Of course, there's a John Fitch Highway as well as the, the name of the city was an early settler, one of the earliest settlers in what was then known as the western part of, Lan of, uh, of uh, Lunenburg. Yeah. And uh, his house, referred to sometimes as a stockade, which was really a frontier house, was on this western fringe during the French and Indian Wars of the 1740s. And in a famous incident in July of 1748, the house was attacked while Fitch and two of his neighbors were out hunting. And uh, they were attacked by a, a mixed uh, band of Indians and Frenchmen, uh, about 80 uh, attackers in all. And uh, Fitch and his neighbors ran back to the house. One of the neighbors was killed on, en route by Indians. The other one got there with Fitch and helped defend the house with Fitch's wife, Susanna. Uh, and the other neighbor was killed in this combat. Fitch and, uh, John Fitch and his wife, Susanna, survived along with their five children but they were taken prisoners. They ran out of ammunition, essentially. They were taken prisoners and sent to Canada. And uh, they were there a um, few months, and the war ended, uh, mm -hmm. the end of that year, 1748. And uh, he came back, his wife uh, came back with him, but died en route from the exertions. Uh, John Fitch remarried, as was the custom at the time. Uh, if you had a young family in particular, you needed someone to care for the family. So there were many widows and widowers mm -hmm. around. And uh, out of respect for John Fitch, his neighbors, uh, when the town in, uh, later got its independence in 1764, uh, it uh, named the community after him. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a rarity. Uh, you don't find incidents in this time in American history in this area in which the community was named after an individual, a living individual. Sure. Typically, they named them like Lord Towns. Townsend was named right. after Lord Townsend, British. the ex British Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, or they named them after some community mm -hmm. in England, like Lemonster and so on, or mm -hmm. Lunenburg, the mm -hmm. name of the royal house, uh, Braunschweig Lunenburg. Lunenburg. Uh, but this was an exception. Mm -hmm. And uh, early settlers seemed to have appreciated that because they commented on the fact that here was an instance of naming your community not for some lord or some previous inhabit inhabited area in the old country, but for a present hero. Mm -hmm. And that's how he was looked at from the beginning, as a, an embodiment of heroism. The name, um, the concept of the synonym for heroism, Fitchburg. Right. Uh, that was actually, um, uh, the expression came from a man named Stephen Shapley, otherwise unknown, who uh, gave a talk in 1876, this would have been on our first centennial, uh, in which he uh, gave, he acknowledged the, uh, the, the debt that his fellow Fitchburgers mm -hmm. were due, mm -hmm. uh, owed to uh, John Fitch. And he, he uh, coined that term a synonym of heroism mm -hmm. to designate both Fitch and those who came after him, mm -hmm. which in a sense is the theme of this whole discussion today. Right. right. Um, Tell me about the music, because as I was reading in your book, one of the things that kind of came through all three wars is the importance of music to the armed soldiers, whether they be Minutemen, Militiamen, uh, whatever. Always seem to have music, starting with fife and drum and going up to big bands. Could you explain some of sure. that? Sure. Uh, fifes and drums were technically called field music. And they were regular fixtures of military establishments. Every company was authorized one fife and one drum. And uh, uh, a regiment consisted of maybe up to 10 or 12 companies. 
Uh, so there would be a fife master and a drum major, or fife major and a drum major in the, every regiment. But uh, companies had each had their fife and their drum. And they, uh, for example, in the case of Fitchburg, uh, Fitchburg sent off in the uh, when, when word of the uh, battles of Lexington and Concord mm -hmm. occurred on April 19, 1775, two companies came, uh, came went from Fitchburg, and uh, very small. One had 41, I think. The other had 29 in it, so these were very small, but one of them at least, maybe both of them, had a fife and drum. But the band of music, uh, which was the designation for the uh, non-fifers and drummers, they, these musicians at the time of the Revolution, they played instruments like oboes, clarinets, French horns, bassoons, and uh, they were not regularly authorized at this mm -hmm. time. Uh, so if your regiment had a band of music, it was only because the company, I mean the regiment's officers, uh, got together money. They set up a band fund to hire either a professor to teach volunteers instruments or to, if they could, uh, persuade uh, instrumentalists to join the regiment. Mm -hmm. So a, a band of music was a mark of uh, status, elite uh, unit, uh, if you had a band. Only seven regiments in the Continental Army are known to have had bands, bands. and Cranes was one of them. In the, then they grew, of course, in the course of the uh, 19th century with the Civil War. Then they did become regular fixtures, and of course, by the time of the Second World War, a uh, 28-piece band was a normal uh, size mm -hmm. of a band. The participation of militia men in, from Fitchburg in the Revolutionary War was pretty significant. Yes. Could you speak about that for just a minute? Sure. The, uh, at the time of uh, the Revolution, in fact before the Revolution, it had been a custom in the settlements of New England and elsewhere uh, for men to be in militias. This dated from the 17th century, so there was a sense of obligation. But in the year uh, or two leading up to the outbreak of the actual revolution, particularly the critical year of 1774, many uh, towns, uh, consuls, established uh, a segment of the uh, militia that they designated Minutemen. Mm -hmm. And they had all kinds of incredible spellings of the word minute, too, in the town mm -hmm. records. Uh, and this was to be one-fourth of the militia. Now, Minutemen were to be, as the name indicates, uh, capable of responding within in a, a minute, minute. <laughs> to, uh, to an emergency. Uh, so it's a mistake to assume that all militias were Minutemen. Mm -hmm. Minutemen were technically just one-fourth of your militia. Okay. And uh, those two companies that went from uh, Fitchburg toward Lexington and Concord, of course they arrived too late for the battle, uh, they were Minutemen companies. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I, I, we need to start moving on towards our Civil War. Um, and as I again read your book, and what I found in your book was, was again, the influence of music in the war effort, but also women played a, a larger role in the Civil War. Could you explain a little bit right. about that? Uh, of course, women did play a role in the Revolution, mm -hmm. too, but they were not part of the armies. They, there were volunteers there, too, of course. In the case of the uh, Civil War, um, there actually was a request uh, uh, sent out, sent out from the Washington, uh, for women to volunteer as nurses. Mm -hmm. And among the most famous, probably the most famous woman from Fitchburg who volunteered as a nurse was Martha, Mar Martha Goodridge. Uh, amusingly, uh, the the announcement in which uh, which appealed to uh, women to uh, volunteer as nurses uh, asked for plain women. I thought that was, that was humorous, <laughs> so yes. Martha, Martha Goodridge was a good enough sport. She didn't let that stop her. <laughs> <laughs> and she did volunteer, and she served throughout the war. She was one of the, the major uh, women uh, in terms of uh, significance in the nursing, what became essentially mm -hmm. a nursing corps. And of course there were others, uh, Mrs. Ebenezer Torrey and Mrs. Lewis Bradford. And I don't know their first names. Uh, they sure. took their husbands' first names, but uh, they too volunteered. They they went to uh, the the battlefield of Fredericksburg. Well, uh, and that was significant. These people didn't That's just right. serve their the the troops at home. That's they right. had to leave this That's area. That's right. That's right. This they they went physically went there and they. Uh, you know, in very raw conditions. Mm -hmm. And this was a battle that was fought in December of 1862, so it was the dead of winter, and uh, they, uh, they tended to the wounded there. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, uh, they didn't just limit their attendance to uh, the Union soldiers. They, Martha Goodridge and others did also tend to uh, Confederate uh, soldiers. Okay. She, she tended to them in a, a camp in Maryland. So it was a, a sense of self-sacrifice. Sure, sure. Um, what, 
at this time during the Civil War, we see a lot of sort of the local Fitchburg names start coming up, the True. names that we recognize either by buildings or streets. Uh, could you go into a little of that yes. history? Yes. Uh, John Kimball, of course, is one of the most famous names. John Kimball was the head of the uh, one of the two companies of militia that existed at the time the Civil War broke out, that is the Fitchburg Fusiliers, and uh, the other one was the Washington Guards. Uh, a man named Upton was in command of the Washington Guards. John Kimball headed the uh, Fitchburg Fusiliers. And uh, when they went off to, uh, to um, uh, their units, uh, they didn't go, uh, they tried to stay as a unit, but essentially they were amalgamated into other units as the war developed. So uh, during the Civil War, Fitchburgers served in a total of six infantry and one artillery regiment, plus the U.S. Navy. And John Kimball's probably most notable uh, achievement was uh, he became promoted to a colonel of a regiment and he fought in a relatively obscure battle, uh, Port Hudson in Louisiana. Uh, the fact, part of the obscurity of Port Hudson is the fact that it's overshadowed by two other famous battles that occurred around the same time, Gettysburg in July of 1863 and Vicksburg in July of 1863. And famously, of course, uh, the American people, the Union, Member, members, people, American people of the Union were able to celebrate two victories on the famous 4th of July of 1863, the victory of Gettysburg mm -hmm. and that of Vicksburg, where Grant uh, commanded. Kimball fought in Port Hudson, which was to the south of Vicksburg. Uh, Port, Husband, H Port Hudson was one of the two, along with Vicksburg, uh, preserves that the Confederates commanded that allowed them to have contact with the western por portion of the Confederacy and in a slogging series of battles, uh, he, uh, he and his unit uh, eventually triumphed, but with huge casualties. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the casualty rate was something like, I think, seven to eight times as many uh, Union members died as, uh, as Confederates. Mm -hmm. After the battle, which when eventually uh, Fort Hudson was surrendered to the Union forces, uh, Kimball's men in the 53rd uh, Massachusetts Regiment returned to Fitchburg they were given a hero's welcome back with a, an enormous crowd for the time of 8,000 people greeting them when they returned. And um, Kimball became promoted to general. Uh, and he and his famous horse, Prince, survived the war. And there's a famous picture of him taken with Prince on Prince at a, uh, a reunion of Civil War uh, veterans later in the 19th century. So he's a prominent figure. There were many other names, Hartwells and others, uh, who also served in that war. Now again, Fitchburg, did have a, a very righteous representation of military who went into the Civil War yes, and served yes. the Civil War. It didn't all start at once as I, read, as I read your book because nobody thought the Civil War was going to go on as long That's as it right. did. They continued to join, but we had what, it, it was about 20% or more uh, that's right. representation. That's, that's right. Uh, out of a town of 8,000? Right. Uh, 8,000, 7,800, yeah. I think, was the, the census of 1860, but they would have been around 8,000. Um, so it's an, a very high figure, not as high as, as the, the actual revolution. Yeah. An incredible 169 men out of a population of 800. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you calculate that half the population mm -hmm. was male, that means you know over 40%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But these were, these were uh, strikingly high percentages. And in general, as I was reading about the, from the sources about the service of both men and women in, in these wars, uh, it's, it struck me how obvious it was to anyone who knows the, the history, how false is the claim that we owe all of our freedoms and rights to government. You know, we've in recent years we've heard the claim, mm -hmm. you didn't build that road, uh, or businesses don't create jobs. Well, anyone who knows Fitchburg's history, for example, knows of Alva Crocker, you know, a famous name in Fitchburg. Mm -hmm. He did build that road. He built many roads. Sure. You know, they wouldn't have been sure. there without him. He built yeah. railroads yeah. that wouldn't have been there without him and certainly the businesses that we created here, which are also a, uh, an indication of our willingness to, to uh, take the initiative. Uh, the initiative didn't come from outside, it came from the people who lived here. Well, and I think also, to your book, it explains it very well that women participated, and even though you might not have gone to war, but many people in Fitchburg participated in the war effort through working exactly. in some of these burgeoning industries to help make uniforms, to help keep the food supplies up, and things like that. So That's Fitchburg right. had a very respectable participation in the war effort. That's right, over and that and goes above. back to the revolution. Sure. It was reconfirmed in, in all of our wars. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, finally, let's move on to World War II. Believe okay. it or not, we're 
coming to our the third war that we're going to talk about tonight. And uh, again, 20% of Fitchburg residents went to World War II, from what I could glean from your book. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about World War II and Fitchburg's participation? Sure. Because now we really hone in on some of the familiar names. That's right. Uh, actually, some of these people who went to war are still alive. Are still alive. George Peltier, for example, a man who I quote in the booklet, uh, was a, uh, a veteran. Uh, he uh, went in at the age of 18 or 19, I think. Uh, many cases of young men who declined to graduate. They just, you know, mm -hmm. volunteered. Uh, and uh, he served, I think, as a machine gunner in campaigns in, uh, in uh, France and Germany. He was in Patton's Third Army. Mm -hmm. uh, there were other individuals. I tried to because so many uh, individuals served. Uh, the, uh, the official number given by the uh, Massachusetts Attorney General's Office, the military subdivision, right after the war, lists 5,407 veterans uh, from Fitchburg. But this number has been contested by members of the Veterans Council here in Fitchburg who claim that it's far more than that. They, mm -hmm. they claim it's probably in excess of 12,000. And at that time, the population of Fitchburg was much what it is today. That's right. It was about 41,000. That's 000. exactly right. That's right. Now, I'm not sure about the 12,000 figure. I think they might be including um, people who moved here subsequently but were not actually from Fitchburg veterans. at the time. That, that's right, veterans who and moved And they subsequent. came probably because of the industries that quite, were here. Quite likely, because that was such a draw, as mm -hmm. we know. Uh, among the things that I had occasion to discover, and the, I did the research for this part of the booklet uh, from the uh, Fitchburg Historical Society. Mm -hmm. Uh, which has a great trove of information there. Uh, among the things I discovered was the contributions of the various ethnic groups. As we know, Fitchburg uh, has benefited from so many different ethnic groups. Some 50 different ethnic groups have contributed to Fitchburg's uh, growth and, uh, and, and diversity. And at the time of the Second World War, the two most prominent uh, ethnic uh, groups were Finns and French Canadian. Mm -hmm. And actually, the French Canadian population uh, segment was larger uh, than the Finnish segment. And going through the, uh, the album prepared by the Attorney General's office after the, uh, the, uh, after the war, uh, I was struck by the frequency of French Canadian names, just mm -hmm. an astonishing figure, a number of them. And as one illustration, because I obviously in a small booklet you can't go mention everyone, but as one illustration, I pointed out um, the Burgo family, Kent mm -hmm. Burgo mm -hmm. of Shaq's oh, clothing Shacks. store. Uh, his family, he said, his father and five uncles wow. were all uh, servicemen in sure. the Second World War. Sure. Uh, so it's an amazing thing. From one family, six, yes. and they all came back. And they, they all, all came lived. Back. Very patriotic. That's right. The fervor in the country. That's right. And uh, as an illustration of uh, the Finnish contribution, uh, he, uh, I found, uh, uh, discovered uh, two Finnish, uh, uh, among many Finnish uh, soldiers, both of whom died, mm -hmm. uh, a young man named uh, Salmi Hietanen, uh, who was amusingly looking for work because he was graduated right into the Depression, as it were. Uh, this is before the war. And he, by accident, met a crocker. Uh, when he was hitchhiking to Gardner to try to find a job, and this, this Crocker offered him a job in one of the factories. So. But he later died in uh, the invasion of Normandy. But. John, why is music so important in military history? We started out with the Revolutionary War and the fife and drum. We went on to the Civil War, where we actually brought brass bands. Right. Now in the, in the World War II, it was, we actually had larger orchestras that were not only part of the military, but the military really relied on it. Was it esprit de corps? Was it part and parcel of, of giving orders before the days of walkie-talkies and, and radios? Or, I mean, what was it? Well, uh, as I mentioned, indeed at a point, uh, field music did give orders. They mm -hmm. transmitted orders. But subsequently, uh, it became a matter not just of entertainment, but also esprit de corps, certainly. Your unit uh, gained in a sense of self-value, uh, mm -hmm. self-worth, if it had a band. Okay. And uh, bands at the time of the Civil War, they were almost entirely brass. Uh, the brass instrument family had been essentially reinvented by that point uh, by, by being given valves. They could now play an entire uh, uh, chromatic scale. And this meant that brass instruments could pull a uh, melodic line and not just a harmonic one as they had with uh, valveless horns in the Revolution. Uh, but uh, if you had a band in your unit, uh, 
it was a mark of distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, it also probably did make you perform better, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there was, uh, there was this level to it. And of course, the bands at the time, because we're talking about 80 year segments here, it's roughly 80 years from the Revolution to the Civil War, and then another 80 years from the Civil War to the outbreak of the Second World War. In all of this huge span of 240 plus years, uh, music undergoes changes too. It reflects the culture of the time. So the, the uh, music that people were listening to at the time of the Civil War, I can just read, if I have time, sure. a few of the uh, works that they were hearing at that time. The Battle Hymn, of course, we heard the Battle Hymn of the Republic. We're coming, Father Abram, you know, the, the, a famous appeal uh, early in the Civil War that uh, was sent out from Washington. The Vacant Chair, which was played at the deaths of uh, military uh, personnel. Uh, Dixie. Mm -hmm. And Lincoln famously said uh, when, uh, the, uh, when Lee surrendered at Appomattox, we've won the war and I guess we have a right to take their song too. So, <laughs> so he was one of his favorite songs, uh, just before the battle mother and so on. Then we move to the Second World War, 80 years later, and there, of course, the popular songs uh, didn't have that high degree of sentimentality that you mm -hmm. associate with the Civil War. They uh, reflect the music of the time, the big band of music of the time, St. Louis Blues March, Moonlight Serenade, Putting on the Ritz, In the Mood, and so on, you know, because Glenn Miller was indeed a volunteer. By the way, I have a brief picture. I don't know well, if it can be picked up. I can, if you can see that. That shows on the top, a, this is Glenn Miller, a Glenn Miller band, okay. and below it is a Civil War brass band, and that's Queen's, the original Crane's music, if you can make Well, that. actually, it's important that we end this program with the music, because in addition to your booklet, you actually wrote your booklet as part and parcel of a performance that right. you put together for Veterans Day as this past year, 2014, as part of the Fitchburg's 250th celebration. And that performance is going to be on FATV. We will link the performance to our YouTube channel as well as this show um, because the music was absolutely astounding and beautiful and it puts you in the mood and nothing better for a cold <laughs> right. winter night than a mug of hot chocolate listening to this show and then going into the music <laughs> Good. because I, I think that's a, a wonderful way to begin the new year. John, thank you so much. Again, it's always a pleasure to have you on, and it's always the fastest half hour on TV, at least for the, the host and the guest of our show. So as we close tonight, we again, John and I and the Fitchburg Republican City Committee, want to wish everybody, again, a very happy, healthy, and prosperous new year as we go into 2015. We thank you for watching Your Right to Know and sitting in here with the Fitchburg Republican City tonight. As we leave you, we want you to know that your local and city and town committee is your only grassroots organization that supports and holds dear your constitutional rights and your liberty. And we encourage you to join us or at least check us out on Facebook and our, our website. Why? Because the GOP, we believe, always stands for freedom, growth, opportunity, and prosperity. Thank you and Happy New Year.